said I'd knock him out in the fourth round, and I knocked him out in the fourth round. You can call me Mystic Mac because I predict these things. Mamma mia! But uh, I'm not impressed by your performance. Welcome everybody to the first ever edition of Sucker Shots, an all new Fight Picks podcast presented by MMASucker.com. I'm your host Jason Burgos and the way the show works is me and a special guest will talk shop and make some picks for a given UFC and Bellator card coming up. The show will focus on UFC Fight Night Rodriguez vs. Penn and it is my honor to have as my first guest the very talented and diverse coaching machine of American Top Team, Dr. Paul Gavoni, a.k.a. Pauly Gloves. How are you doing, Pauly? Hey, man. I'm stoked to be here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm excited. I always love talking, you know, fights and MMA and all kind of stuff. And to be able to talk with an expert and, you know, great mind in the sport, it's just exciting. Well, I appreciate that, man. I I like talking shop. I like uh, checking out styles, and I like uh, you know kind of seeing how guys match up. So uh, I'm down for it. Now, when we do these kind of shows, of course we're going to do fight picks, but you know we want to talk to our guests. That's that's the best part of it, having a guest. So of course I want to talk to you about the many things you have going on. You're you know you're a renaissance man. You're you hustle. You do all the kind of things to you know get your name out there and and you know spread a great message. Now. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, big news. I know you saw Rogue One twice. What did you think of Star Wars Rogue One? <laughs> oh, I loved it, man. I would highly recommend it to anybody. I've been a big uh, – I'm not going and dressing up in lines and, wear, you know, wearing a Luke Skywalker <laughs> outfit or anything like that, you know. But uh, I've always been a Star Wars fan, so uh, I highly recommend it to anybody. Oh, man. I haven't seen it yet. I'm dying to see it. Um, no spoilers, of course, but is is the Darth Vader stuff they have in it awesome? Well, it's just kind of cool seeing him come back, man. So, uh, it's a, you know, it's nostalgic to say the least. Um, uh, and it just had a it was a great storyline. I was very impressed with it. Okay, now on to other real big news. Now you have a book out, which is awesome. That you know, you have a book that's just amazing. Uh, you you call through a book with uh, Manuel Rodriguez called "Quick Wins: Accelerating School Transformation Through Science, Engagement, and Leadership." Uh, just tell me a little bit a bit about how the book came about. Like, how did it work out that it happened, and what's the premise of it, and what's it all about? Well, you know, what's kind of cool is that, and I it, you know, I use it obviously in my coaching is that I'm uh, I'm schooled in the science of human behavior, something called applied behavior analysis. So. The good thing is it's, it's, it's science, and it, because it's about human behavior, it has something to do with everything that has to do with people, any behavior that you do. So um, when I work with my coaches, I apply some of the scientific principles. Uh, when I work with schools and teachers and school leaders and, and kids, I apply the principles. And really, it's just about bringing out the best in people. It's about how to use uh, scientific methodology, very simple premises um, to really help accelerate performance. And again, it's... It's the same strategies uh, embedded, you know, the same science that I use with my uh, fighters. So um, it's kind of grab, a grab-and-go book, and uh, it's really made for any stakeholder that's working in schools, and it's, it's literally the first of its kind. There's never been a book that applies the science of human behavior to groups, which is called organizational behavior management, uh, in education. So this is a first, and uh, we're really proud of the book, um, and uh, you know, we hope to make, uh, do big things with it. Is it something that's for all ages, or it's more for educators and you know leaders and coaches, or, or, or you know some seventy-year-old kid on a football team could they read it and like you know really take something important from it? No, uh, you know they, they they could probably because it talks about leadership and it's the science behind leadership. I mean, it's really geared towards educators, uh, but they can grab it and just go bring it to the school leader and say, "Listen, man, you got to read this because." <laughs> it's going to help the whole school. It's going to help the teachers. But I mean, if, if folks are interested in listening to the podcast and uh, you know they want to see about the science, they really should go to you know. I've written some stuff for MMA Sucker. I've written some stuff for Last Sport on Sports and Fight Science, and and most recently Bloody Elbow. And they can see about the application of the science in the sport. Uh, it's really cool, man. It's very unknown. People really only think it's for working with children with disabilities. But it's generalizable everywhere, so um, I'm really happy to share it with the world of education and the world of mixed martial arts. 
so it's cool. How long does it take, the, like, the process of writing a book? I, I got to imagine, even when you're co-authoring, it's such an arduous and long task. Like, how long did it take you to write the whole thing? Um, you know, I actually kind of started a couple years ago, and it's just been in me. It kind of needed to come out, you know, so I... I put together a, a, a draft of it, and I was originally going to write it with uh, another partner of mine named uh, Dr. Scott Neal, um, but he's been just very busy. So I happened to run into Manny Rodriguez at a conference, and he's just an amazing guy, man, just brilliant. He's the vice president of ABA Technologies. He's very well known in the field of organizational behavior management. And when he, you know, he had me at hello. The way he, was, he spoke, I'm like, man, it just really resonated with me. I felt like we were very – like-minded so i reached out to him i said you know hey i'd like to do some stuff with you i i have this book i've been working on i'd like to send it to you and he picked up and read it he's and he loved it and he just he, he moved everything to the kind of the back of his schedule and put this on the top and he really invested in it so it was really you know melding of our minds here and it, you know it takes time so by the time he got the first uh draft of it and to the time it uh got published that was a year, and I would say that I'd worked on it probably, you know, just kind of picking at it for about a year before. So the process has been about two years, and honestly, the, 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 the knowledge that's gone into it, obviously, that's been, you know, b- between the two of us, that's 30 years in the making. Now, um, you know, along with your duties at American Top Team Coach and the likes of Brad Pickett and Jamie Alvarez and Matt Snell. I mean, you also do a lot of, you know, uh, speaking engagements, and you recently did uh, the Florida Lacrosse Coaches Convention. You know, what made you get into doing the speaking engagements? You know, what's the message you try to convey to the audiences? Is it similar to the book on leadership and engagement? And, um, you know, how much do you like doing it? You know, just tell me a little bit also about that. Yeah, absolutely. Again, at the root of uh, my my talks is the science of human behavior, and it's really I look at it as the science of helping people, the science of bringing out the best of people. So I don't know anything at all about lacrosse, but I know about the science of human performance. I know how to coach. Um, you know, what I know about leadership. Uh, in any leadership book that you read, any coaching book that you read, anything that you read that has to do with people. Again, the science of human behavior is at the root of it. So. When I go speak to them, I really just talk about, you know, some basic methodologies of the science. Um, I talk about the art, too. I talk about communication because there's a lot of folks out there that really know the science deeply, but they're really unable to communicate it. They're almost like too sciencey, for lack of a better word, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, you have to have good, you know, you have to have good people skills and you have to be strength based and you have to understand what positive reinforcement is. And you have to understand how to use measurement, and feedback and pinpoint behaviors, you know, that 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 are aligned with goals and you know, again, all these things are generalizable, so it's uh, it was really fun talking to them, and I, I love seeing, like, people's eyes light up and just kind of lean in and just so engaged and, like, amazed at it. And honestly, man, public speaking, I used to be petrified to public speak. <laughs> it's, it, yeah, it's my biggest accomplishment, man, being able to get out in front of people and talk and share my feeling and have them uh, find something meaningful, you know, in it. it really, uh, it's meaningful to me, so uh, I, I enjoy it. And, you know, it certainly doesn't hurt to get paid to do it, so. Yeah, no, certainly not. Do you, are you, you have any upcoming paid engagements that if anybody's listening in those possible areas, they can maybe go check it out? Um, I, I got invited to, after this speech. I got invited to uh, uh, speak at the national convention or one of their conventions coming up for the cross, but I don't actually have anything on the schedule. But, um, there's some stuff on if they just Google my name, uh, Dr. Paul Gavoni, uh, or Dr. Polly Gloves or Polly Gloves, you'll find a couple things out there. I, I actually recorded, uh, I did a pod, not a podcast. I did a video record, a webinar. I'm sorry of, uh, it's called, uh, why schools fail and uh, what to do about it. So I, uh, so I, I talk about, uh, you know, really changing schools around, um, which is, you know, really at the root of uh, what I talk about in the quick win. So, if, you know, if somebody's interested in that that's listening to the podcast, check it out. Now, on to the uh, MMA part of your very busy schedule. Now, I saw recently that one of your fighters, Brad Pickett, he's going to uh, be fighting Henry Brionis in London on March 18th. Uh, is There's, you know, rumblings about the might, you know, Brad might be wrapping up his career. Do you think this might be officially the last fight of his career? Is it looking like that's going to be it? Oh yeah, there's no rumbling. It's that this is it. Brad's calling it his last dance. Um, honestly, when I read his uh, first blog about it, you know, he was giving some people a shout out, and uh, 
I kind of got teary eyed with it, man. I mean, I love this guy. He, you know, he's more than a, a fighter. You know, more than a guy coach, man. He's a very deep and dear friend. He's just one of the greatest guys I know. You know, just so authentic, such a real person, man. And like, you know, when he wins, I win. When he loses, I lose. You know, and uh, you know, it's gonna be it, it's bittersweet. You know, I'm glad that he's hanging out the gloves because. You know, listen, man, the, the sport evolves quickly. And at 38 years old, in his weight class, it's challenging, man. And, uh, you know, I don't want to see him get hurt. I want to see him perform well. I want to see him happy. He's got a, you know, he's got a beautiful wife, Sarah, and a, and a beautiful, smart son. Um, oh, Lord. Uh, buddy. And, uh, man, you know, he's just getting out at the right time. And I think he's got some plans. Uh, matter of fact, I don't think. I'm sure he has some plans afterwards. I'm excited about those things for him. But, it's bittersweet, you know, like I enjoy the moments. I enjoy him coming down to camp and working with him at American Top Team. I I go spend the weekend. I, I sleep at Mike Brown's house and, uh, you know, we work with him Friday night and Saturday morning and some of the other guys. But, you know, he's a prankster. He's a fun guy. And, uh, you know, he's just a great guy, man. So uh, it'll be bittersweet. Now, it's, uh, you know, still a couple months out. Looking at it right now, you know, how are you feeling about the fight? Like, do you see – some good positive advantages going into the fire Briona. So, you know, you still need to look at some tape to get an idea how you're going to game plan this one. No, it's listen, this is an ideal matchup with it. Briona's is going to come forward. He's going to fight and Brad's going to come forward. He's going to fight. Um, you know, we got some work to do. Uh, but I, you know, I think Brad's going to be really up for this fight. Um, honestly, in his last fight, uh, when it was all said and done, because, you know, he had gotten uh, stopped the fight before, I think that he was more, you know, but he was always known for just balls of the wall, you know, you just bring it. But he just wanted to finish the fight, you know. He would, he didn't follow up with, uh, you know, his combinations with uh, Uriah Faber. I mean, he could have beat Uriah. There's no doubt about it. But psychologically, uh, his goal was something different. We, you know, we had to kind of process that at the end, and you know, that, that's another kind of leading indicator. Like, you know, what? It's probably time to uh, hang up the gloves and call it a day but i think he's going to bring it for this fight he's fighting in london uh mm -hmm. in front of his home crowd mm -hmm. and they love him uh he loves them and uh, i'm quite sure that he's going to leave it all in the cage that night uh either he's going to take this guy out or he's going to go out on a shield you, you can bank on that now moving from that on you know to the picks aspect of the show now we're going to cover ufc fight night rodriguez penn uh there's four main card fights uh, one of the first fights on the main card is John Moraga at 16-5 against Sergio Pettis at 14-2, the brother of um, Anthony Pettis. Now, some of the interesting things going into the fight is Moraga is on a two-fight losing streak. He is 3-3 three and three since his title fight loss to Demetrius Johnson. Pettis has eight decision wins in his 14 victories, so he's more of a decision guy. You know, he's willing to move around and wait it out and get a decision win. He's also on a two-fight win streak, and is actually 5-2 and two since he's been in the UFC. Now, some of the, the – I have for all the picks. I'm going to throw it at you, you know, on the various picks. Uh, some things to wonder for every fight is, uh, you know, Moraga is a guy that likes to throw bombs. He has, you know, good pop for his division. But I was looking at the stats. The, oh, the interesting thing is for a guy that's known for being big for 125 pounds and a, a heavy hitter, he only has two KO TKOs out of his wins, which is pretty interesting to me. So it makes me wonder if a guy like Sergio moves around – and is active and is willing to, you know, go the distance. How is he going to be able to, to catch him? Is he going to have a problem with that? Like, like, what are your thoughts if you have a fighter who's more of a plotting type? You know, he likes to throw heavy. I mean, in a way, Moraga's style is similar to a Brad Pickett. How would you try to game plan for a Pettis brother who they like to move and they have a lot of karate stylings and kicks? You know, how would you plan for something like that? You know, you know it's in, in the... The UFC cage is almost like a third opponent, right? Because um, it's so big that folks that have a lot of lateral movement actually have an advantage. And in smaller shows or even like amateur shows, got the cage is really small. Um, if you're a wrestler, if you're a guy that likes to move forward, it gives you an advantage, right? So in the UFC, guys that like to use lateral movements, that like to draw, guys like McGregor or Wonder Boy that can use all this cage if somebody tries to engage them, um, they have advantage. So... In this case, if you had a guy that likes to plot forward, if he's not good at cutting the cage off, if he's not good at slipping inside or engaging uh, the opponent when the opponent actually tries to strike them uh, to close the distance, uh, he's going to have our time, man. That kind of movement that Pettis is going to bring to the fight, 
uh, is going to be a challenge for somebody with uh, you know, this guy's style. So the other thing is he's coming off two losses. So how is he handling that? Is mm-hmm. it self-efficacy or his belief in his ability? Uh, how's that impacting him psychologically? Uh, so he's got some demons likely to overcome and uh, against the guy with that kind of movement. You know, it's a tough task for him. Yeah, I, I, and that's why for me I'm going to pick Sergio Pettis in that fight. I just think he's the, the younger fighter on the way up. Moraga's dangerous. I mean, he's been in there with very good fighters. He's been in there with Benavidez and the champion Mighty Mouse. You know, I think he made a great point. Like, what's he going to feel pressure-wise coming up two losses? Like, you have to think at, for a person like that, he has to wonder if a third loss could get him released. And, you know, it's a lot of pressure going into a fight, and I, I worry about something like that. While a guy like Pettis a little more looser, a little bit more younger, doesn't have that quite – idea of the maturity of like you know long-term thinking but uh i'm gonna pick pettis in a fight but moving on from that fight is also is the next fight court mcgee at 18 and 5 versus ben saunders at 27 and 2 uh mcgee a former ultimate fighter winner is also uh two and two in his last four uh his most notable win of his career is a split decision win over robert whitaker all the way back in 2013 uh, i don't know if he'd be able to beat 2016 2017 robert whitaker um for Saunders, he's 4-1 and one since he returned to the UFC from Bellator, where he had a good run. Uh, his lone loss was a second-round TKO to Patrick Ote, and Patrick Ote has been uh, you know, a much more interesting fighter, 170 pounds. Uh, of his 20 wins, 16 are finishes. I mean, he has 9 KOs and TKOs or, and 7 submissions. I mean, the, the guy is a Carlos Condit-like finisher. If he gets you hurt, he's going to be good at finishing. I mean, what's your early thoughts and what's your pick for Court McGee and Ben Saunders? Man, you, it's an interesting match, matchup. You know, Court McGee always brings this kind of high level of conditioning. I see his striking as being kind of average. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think he's a great striker. I'm not sure about his power. Um, I think he brings some wrestling to the game. Um, I mean, Ben Saunders is, is a seasoned vet. I've seen, you know, he, he's had a couple of performances that I'm like, hmm, that's kind of odd, you know, but because he, his striking is, is very good. He's got, you know, really good jits, really solid jits. Um, his wrestling is questionable, um, but you know I really have to. I mean, and you know, listen, listen, losing to Cote, there's no shame in that, man. I mean, that that's a great fighter. Um, he, the only question with Ben would be his desire. How much does you know? How hard does he train? How much does he want this? Um, I think if he comes in with the right mindset, um, I'm going to lead towards uh, Ben. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm picking the same. I was looking at their their stats also as a. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting if it goes to the ground because, like I mentioned, with Saunders, he has seven submission wins. But I don't know if Court McGee actually has seven submission wins too. So I actually like to see that fight go to the ground and see how it plays out, especially with Saunders and his length that he's so rangy and, you know, lanky and on the floor. But, I mean, if it goes to the, the standing, you know, I think you said it perfect. Like, uh, McGee's striking is, you know... It's fine, but Ben Sonnen is a little bit more dangerous there. So I think if it had to go striking, you know, he's going to use the reach he has. And he, he, he would probably, you know, I, I think he, he probably gets a, a finish. I can see him finishing McGee. And, again, similar situation. Like a guy that's not, you know, on a, he's not on a hot streak. He's had some losses. He's got to start worrying about, you know, people getting released. Or is he on the, the chopping block with another loss or two? So, I mean, as a... As a as a coach, and you, you know, you've had various fighters. What is the mindset of a fighter that maybe had back to back losses? I mean, how do you deal with something like that where you're feeling a pressure? You know, you got to get a win. You know, you're, you're not a superstar, so you got you can't necessarily stay in the UFC just off off of several losses because you have a name. Like, what's that fear like, and how do you you know help a fighter deal with that and try to focus on the the task at hand? Yeah, I mean, the fear is very real, and it can have a very real impact on uh, the fighter's uh, performance in the you know the cage. If they if they doubt themselves, that means that they're a lot less likely to commit to things, and uh, they won't perform well. In fact, uh, self-efficacy or one's confident in their ability to do a specific task is actually one of the biggest predictors of success across any field. Um, so, if I were the coach, you know, I'd, I would have him actually go back and review tape of himself when he was being successful. Uh, clearly review tape of what, why did he lose these last two fights and if, it, if there's a pattern there um, put him in situations where if it, they have to build up the skills build those skills up um, get him in a position where it gets like a high level of live reps with them uh, so he actually starts to build up his belief and his self-efficacy in those skills because maybe he's making the same kind of mistakes so he kept losing because of something very simple um, you know like we got triangle twice I'm actually not sure why 
why he lost his last two fights. But, you know, whatever it was, like, you want to make sure that it's not a skill deficit. Um, and if it's a motivation deficit, in other words, uh, he doesn't believe in himself, well, then you got to kind of scale back and put these guys into situations where they start to feel successful. It might be, you know what, we're not going to do 100% sparring right now because he's not sparring very well. We're going to scale it back to 50% sparring. We're going to do something called prescriptive sparring where we're going to work on one or two very specific skills and we're going to do it till we get enough reps where you're performing well. And then we start to increase the speed of it. We increase the power. We add in some more uh, uh, techniques to it. So we really begin to build the fighter's confidence. We don't throw him over his head yet. We put in an opponent that's at a relative level so we can shape the success. And then we start to bring in somebody that has more skills. And that's how you build their confidence. And if they perform well against this guy that they believe have more skills, all right, you know, we're doing better. But again, on top of that, uh, watching video. Very important, watch a video of himself, watching a video of his opponent. All these things can be very powerful ways to build somebody's uh, confidence or self-efficacy. Now, the next fight on the card, the co-main event, is a fascinating fight. It's a, a classic battle of youth versus experience. You have Marcin Held, 22-5, and five, versus Joe Lozon, who's 26-2. and two. Um, You know, Held, just like Lozon, is a very dangerous submission guy. 22 of his wins are... Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. I got the stats wrong, but he's got a lot of submission wins. Uh, this is his second fight in the UFC. He lost his debut via decision to Diego Sanchez after having a fantastic 11-2 and run in Bellator. I mean, now Joe Lozon, everybody knows Joe Lozon. Joe Lozon is one of the most fun, entertaining fighters ever in the UFC. The guy never has an easy day off. The perfect example is Lozon is 3-3 three and three in his last six fights, which, you know, is, is tough. You know, it's not the most exciting, impressive thing to be 3-3, three and three, but... His three wins are against Michael Chiesa, Takanori Gomi, and the aforementioned Diego Sanchez. All those are good wins. And then his losses are to Al Ayakinta, Evan Dunham, and Jim Miller. And those are all, those, none of those losses are to be ashamed about. So he always fights tough guys. Um, when I was thinking about it, I wanted to know, uh, like, if, since they're both ground specialists, it usually sometimes happens where... The, like if a guy, two guys have a similar style, it cancels each other out, and they have to go somewhere else. So if it goes to the feet, Lozon is always willing to mix it up. He's always willing to strike. You know, while Held is younger and probably a better athlete, you know, he's he's just a tough top, you know, top notch contender always. And like, what difference does that kind of experience at the highest level mean for Lozon, even at a more advanced age than someone like Marcin Held? Well, I mean, it really does. Having that kind of experience, man, it just is a, it's a real confidence builder. Knowing you've been in there with some of the greatest guys in the world, um, you know, he's bringing a lot of experience. Knowing that, you know, you were the underdog and uh, that you always kind of rise to the top. These are all very impactful, uh, you know, psychological elements that can really uh, be uh, a huge, have a huge impact on his uh, performance. Um, you know, I look at it, these guys are both great submissions. I'm, I'm very excited about this fight. I yeah, mean, me too. I, yeah, I think this actually could be a fight of the night type fight because mm-hmm. you're right. They do kind of cancel each other out. I kind of like to see him go on the ground, man, just to see what yeah. happens. But, yeah. Yeah. In the, in the case where things cancel each other out, um, and usually it's like wrestlers seem to cancel each other out. I don't know that, you know, how, how great e- either of these guys' wrestlings are, but so they could end up on the ground where they're trying to, you know, see what they got going on. It could be a chess match. Um, but I looked at Held striking, man, and I just, his striking seems a bit raw. It seems a bit rudimentary. I mean, uh, you know, he gets by with it, but I don't think it's the strength of his. Um, I, you know, I think uh, Lozon's got some proficient striking, you know. I don't, I'm not saying he's a world-class striker, but he's effective with it. Um, so I think if, if it were to say striking, um, you know, I, I'm going to actually lead towards uh, Lozon on this one. I'm, I'm kind of Pulling for him, a bit of a fan, so uh, you know that's the direction I'm leading with him. I'm actually going to be rooting for him too, but I don't think he's going to win. Uh, like I, I just, I don't know. I, I think every point you made is is dead on, but I just have this feeling like he's getting to that point with the he's getting long in the tooth, so to speak. And he's been around so long. He's he's opened his training, you know, camps, and he's doing his academies, and you know, I, I think he still loves the sport, but I don't know. I just feel like this is one of those things where. You know, maybe held. He, he's a good enough submission guy that he gets Lozon down. He kind of holds him there and grinds out a decision. 
and you know is smart enough on the ground to not get caught by Lozon because Lozon is just filthy on the ground. I, I'm hoping Lozon wins, but I just have a, a weird feeling that Held's gonna get it. But moving on from that to another classic. <laughs> Age and experience versus young and up and coming lion is the main event of the card. Yair Rodriguez at nine and one versus the legend BJ Penn sixteen ten and two. Which is you think sixteen ten and two? You're like, oh god, that's not the greatest record. But when you look at the resume of who BJ Penn has fought his his career, it's very it's like Sakuraba and and Vandalay. Like they had no easy fights. They fought the best. That's why he has that record. And now Rodriguez, the ultra fire Latin America winner, like I said, nine and one, but he's five and zero in the UFC. You know, on a hot streak, up and coming star. Uh, his most notable wins are against Daniel Hooker, pretty good fighter, and a split decision over Alex Caceres, where they made an event to the fight night. You know, he's a well rounded guy, very dangerous on the feet. Now, I mean, what is there to say about a BJ Penn other than lately BJ Penn is not been BJ Penn? He is one five and one. Since losing the lightweight title to Frankie Edgar in 2010. He hasn't fought in over two years. And the last time he did fight regularly was in 2011. Of his 16 wins though, 13 are finishes. 7 KO, TKO, and 6 subs. So if classic BJ Penn shows up, I mean the guy is a killer. The question is, Paulie, is there any chance, especially after how bad he looked against Frankie Edgar in his last fight, is old BJ Penn gone? Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is that in this game, it evolves it evolves so quick. The fighters, to, to be at the level of that you can perform at a, at a high level, you got about three to five years, if you're lucky. Um, but in that three to five years, not just like you performing at a high rate because of your age and you're peaking out, but it's also that the game just moves forward so quickly, so he was the man in his day, but the athletes, it's just, just a whole different game now. Uh, they're bringing a whole different, you know, approach to the game. The movement's different. I mean, this guy, if I were BJ and I was coming back, I wouldn't have picked this guy. Yeah. I think this is a, he's explosive <laughs> with his striking, man. He's all over the place. I mean, I would have picked the guy that, you know, might have been a good jits guy. You know what I mean? That didn't have yeah. great striking. Yeah, he was supposed to get Cole Miller, and then he had the whole issue with Usad and the IV. But that would have been, despite the length, and that would have been a problem. I think, yeah, that would have been a nicer matchup for him. Yeah, that would that would have been a good matchup. You know, Cole and BJ would have been, because it's a different type of game. You know, Cole would have stayed in there and, and banged them with a bit. You know, uh, you know, BJ might have been, you know, some of his boxing to get inside Cole's reach. Um, but this guy, this guy is very mobile. Very explosive. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, unless this guy makes a big mistake, I don't see, I, I don't just see, I don't see a path to victory for BJ. Now let me. And, throw he's, a, and he's a legend. He's a great guy. Let me throw these two things out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's fun facts going into the fight. And again, as a coach, you have the expert knowledge. Tell me how this uh, can matter to a fighter, or it's it's all for naught. You know, he's gone back to Jason Perillo as his boxing coach. And Jason Perillo was the guy that helped him become, like, the premier boxer in MMA for years. He was the guy that was coaching and striking when he was on a, the, the one of the baddest men in the lower weight classes. And then BJ being BJ, you know, he separated from him and wants to do his own thing. You know, he's back with him also. Away from the BJ Penn Classic, he's actually finally gone to a legitimate camp in Jackson Winklejohn. He's not at Camp Yes Man in Hawaii where he's not really testing himself and iron sharpening iron. At his age, is that enough? Can that help him? Can that draw something out of him? Or when the physical gifts are gone and there's questions about your true desire, is that kind of stuff just all for naught? No. Oh, I mean, listen, man, they have a great camp. And uh, it sounds like he's doing some things to, you know, kind of rekindle that fire, um, move in the right direction. So, yeah, I certainly do believe that it can impact performance, you know, and it's probably going to help bring the best out of him. Um, but, you know, there's so many factors, man, wear and tear, you know, how much do you want to get in there? I mean, because these guys, when they're at their peak, they want to be the best every second, and every day and every fight and every time they spar with somebody. And that's, you know, steel uh, sharpens steel. So this really keeps these guys at an elite level. Um, and when you get past a certain age, it's just like you don't want to take that beat anymore. You don't desire to be grinded on or take the beatings to the head. And as a result, you just can't be as sharp as you would otherwise. Now, obviously, you can't spar as much and 
do anything when you're older, you know, you, things that you can get away with when you're younger that help you to be more precise, uh, have really good timing, to know your distance, to really push your conditioning. And, you know, obviously BJ's conditioning was always a question. But, yeah. I mean, I think he was smart to go to the camp. I think they'll bring the best out of them. They got a fantastic camp. You know, they have brilliant coaches. Um, you know, so we're probably going to see a better BJ as a result, mm. but I don't, you know, I just don't see a uh, BJ that's going to be good enough to, you know, at this point to beat this guy. Yeah. I think you said it perfectly. Jair is the wrong kind of match. The guy, he, he's very, oddly enough, very similar to, to Tony Ferguson, just completely unorthodox. You don't know what's coming. He's fast. You said explosive, another, you know, great analysis. And yeah, it's just BJ at his age. I don't know if he can deal with that kind of just unorthodox style and the thing that drives me crazy i always like bj penn as crazy as he is as a pain in the butt as he is you know the guy was the still maybe to this day the best 155 ever that's always been his optimal weight yet he goes and fights at 170 against likes of nick diaz and rory mcdonald and just gets plastered now he's going down at 145 you know he it, it's maddening that such a talented fighter won't fight where he probably should and now he's going to sap himself at an advanced stage where you even just mentioned it cardio and that kind of thing was always a problem it, it it's unfortunate cuz you don't want to see legends be remembered for how they finish and if he loses he's going to be 1-6 and 1 at the end of his career and i think he's going to lose and i and and do you think like i think he probably gets i think he can he'll probably get a decision um, you know, so just, he's just so tough. And, you know, getting beat up by Nick Diaz and uh, Rory McDonald, those are big men. I mean, he's a small bit, but you never know. Do you think he, if he does lose, can he at least, you know, make it competitive and make it to decision? Or do you think Yair might actually finish him? Uh, I think he's going to get finished. Oof. What um, round? Um, you know, this stuff is so hard to predict, man. Um, <laughs> That's why we're uh, here. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, you know, I would say second round. You know, I mean, he does. He's tough. He's durable. You know, uh, he wants to be competitive. But I think, I think if he doesn't have success early, it's going to get into his mind psychologically because he is on a losing. Uh, you know, he's on a, a losing streak. So if he doesn't have early success, which I don't see the, how that that could happen, as um, soon as he catches a couple of those kicks, a couple, you know kicks to the head it's like all right you know i don't really want to do this anymore so <laughs> man and it's true man I, i've seen it happen with, with a lot of fighters uh it's just kind of the nature of the beast i'd rather have seen them man i would have loved to seen uh you know brad go up for a super fight you know at, at 145 with bj that oh, would have been fun, that been fun. <laughs> yeah but but anyways i don't you know guy bj is a great fighter man you know he's great for the sport he brought a lot of passion brings it um, I I think their camp should have. I don't think they should have taken this fight. I think they should have went a, a different direction. Personally, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's that kind of classic. The UFC is trying to make a name for Rodriguez off of his own name, and unfortunately, the legend is going to be the sacrificial lamb. But all right, that's all of our picks for tonight. Um, you know, hopefully, we'll be back soon with another card. And you have UFC. We'll, we'll be covering Bellator one one seventy, which is going to be huge soon. Um, thank you so much, Paul, for being a part of the show. Is there anything you want to, you know, get a shout out to in, in terms of Twitter, social media, Facebook, Instagram, anything you want to let the people know that are listening? Uh, yeah, you know, connect me on Facebook, follow me at, uh, Polly Gloves and Dr. Polly Gloves on Instagram. Um, we should give a shout out to all my fighters, uh, of course, Brad Pickett, Jamie, Matt, um, uh, my amateur fighters. I don't get a chance to talk about, I got a guy fighting next week black dragon christian pews fighting for belt uh mother guy uh, uh uh tony champa yeah tony man this guy yeah he's fantastic man he's the the, the the everman's champ this guy just keep you know he's like the uh uh kind of built like tank abbott you know uh he's like what's the guy's name with the beard i'm just forgetting his name right now um, oh, Roy nelson yeah he's yeah. like the He's like the Roy Nelson of the amateurs right now, and he keeps taking on these guys that are, you know, Tony's only uh, five foot nine, so these guys are six foot five, you know, two six, just just jacked, you know. Nobody thinks Tony's gonna win, and uh, man, he just brings a big heart. We got him dropping bombs, and uh, we're actually fighting a huge guy. I think we're fighting a guy that's like six foot seven for a title coming up, so I'm excited about that. Uh, Quentin Bray, another one of my amateur fighters. Uh, so we give a shout out to them, a shout out to uh, my uh, team, Team Legacy, Coach uh, Hanata Tavares, he's a legend in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Coach uh, Joel 
Garcia, another legend of Muay Thai. Uh, I'm really surrounded by a great, great team of folks up here and our local gym, Legacy, and, of course, a shout-out to American Top Team and the fellows I train out down there. Johnny Evelyn, another up-and-coming uh, amateur. So, uh, you know, just love everybody. All right. Thank you so much, Paulie. That is our show. We will see you next time. Check in for the next show. Bye-bye, everybody.